assume you can see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay, and it's on a different screen. So if I turn to my right, it's not because I don't want to see your faces, but it's because I have a different screen. So I apologize if that's uh, irritating. Um, so what, what we thought we'd be doing now is give you a brief um, demo uh, of a pilot that uh, we've implemented that uh, myself and my team here at Los Alamos National Laboratory have implemented to showcase the potential of the technology that we're suggesting. Uh, and also give you uh, basically something something more concrete to to play with uh, um, and and to really uh, take in what what this can do and what the potential of the uh, the framework and the the systems really are. Um, this is very simple. Right? This is very much a, a vanilla uh, pilot sort of thing. So it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. It, the UI looks really ugly, as you can see, but it's uh, it, it hopefully um, serves the purpose of showcasing uh, um, what we're trying to achieve here. And then after a brief demo, I'll uh, use some slides to step up a little bit in, the term, in terms of uh, yeah, altitude, really, and uh, look at it from, uh, from a conceptual view. And uh, I will go over the uh, bits and pieces that are really needed to implement something like this. And I'll probably uh, toggle back and forth between the demo and uh, the, the slides uh, to highlight, okay, this is what it's needed. And here's how, we, how we've implemented it, right? So really to, to tie these, all these things together. Uh, that's the whole point. And uh, uh, this, this uh, brief demo and the slides will then be followed by a Q&A session where we'll, we'll hope that uh, you know, we have a vivid discussion about all these, these sort of things and what can be done, pros and cons, uh, gaps, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, jump right in. Uh, we have implemented a uh, repository that, of course, is not real, but it you know, serves the purpose. It is available at uh, scholarlyorphans.org slash repository. And that is you know, your publishing platform, you name it. It's your institutional repository, it's your publishing platform, it's your preprint, you name it. It's a system where you, uh, you publish um, manuscripts, let's say, right? In this particular case, I've already uploaded a whole bunch of uh, PDF uh, papers and I'll um, continue doing so by uploading a new document to really walk you through uh, a brief process there. So uh, I hit the upload a new document uh, button and uh, I have, it's like a cooking show, right? I have prepared something. Um, and in a act of shameless self-promotion, I will upload uh, a paper that I published last year, uh, copy and paste the title of that paper in the corresponding form field here. Uh, author is myself for the sake of simplicity. I'll leave out uh, Luda, my second author, my co-author on this, on this work. And uh, the system asks me for a uh, for the orchid of the corresponding author. Well, that is uh, me in this case, and uh, I just copy and paste my orchid into the corresponding field here. And uh, the reason why I do that will become clear in a second. I hit the browse button, uh, upload the paper that I want, this one here, and hit, hit upload. And uh, so the paper is called On the Persistence of Persistent Identifiers uh, of the Scholarly Web. And uh, while uploading the paper, a persistent identifier in the system for that work was created. Uh, it looks really ugly, but it's a persistent identifier. Um, and, um, and, and this is basically now my, my landing page for the article, right? So if I go back to um, the uh, entire list of repositories, I can see on the bottom, uh, sorted chronologically in uh, temporal order, is the new article that I just uploaded. So that's you know very similar to you know uploading a paper to you know archive.org for example or any other uh, publishing platform that you can envision. All right, so now uh, I can go back to uh, to the landing page of the article. You can see some more metadata about this and so on and so forth. So let's assume now uh, Kathleen comes along and um, uh, sees that there's a new paper article um, paper, paper uploaded. And she's like kind of, um, you know, skeptical about the quality of this work, let's say, right? So she wants to uh, request peer review on this work, All right? So good thing that there, there, there's a button for that, uh, which um, uh, I click because it uh, allows me to request a peer review for this just uploaded article. All right, so uh, Kathleen needs to identify herself as the requester of this uh, 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 peer review request, and she has an ORCID. So I just copy and paste her ORCID into the corresponding form field. And uh, now she needs to indicate where this request should be sent. So which peer review service would she like to send this request to? Which peer review service would she like to engage in the process of, uh, of creating a peer review for that article? Well, just like for our repository, we have created a peer review service 
excuse me, uh, that does just that, uh, organized peer review for um, works, right? So and this peer review service is uh, um, for the sake of the, uh, uh, demonstrating the distributed notion of the infrastructure is uh, available at a different URI. It is available at myresearch.institute slash reviewer. So uh, I need to know the base URL, what I just uh, mentioned, of this peer review service. And I copy uh, the, that URL into my form field here. And now I'm saying, okay, Kathleen uh, would like to request a peer review uh, of this work, of the, my uh, the just uploaded paper um, conducted by the peer review service um, uh, identified at my research at institute slash reviewer. And I hit complete submission. All right, I let this sit here for a second uh, and I go back to my peer review service and I do a reload on the entry page basically. And I'll see that the request has been received uh, at the service and it is listed now uh, under the category of items that are waiting to be reviewed. Okay, right. so I can click on it and uh, click on it. And this is my, basically my, my, my landing page for this peer review. And I get a whole bunch of information, metadata uh, provided there. For example, you know, uh, um, what was submitted? Uh, uh, what's the, the orchid of the author? Who is the author? What's the, uh, the title of the work? And also what's the persistent identifier of this work for which um, peer review has been requested. And that of course the persistent identifier is the, the pit that the uh, repository has issued while I uploaded the work. So now um, let's say the peer review service engages Paul in, and trusts Paul to conduct a really good peer review for this work. So uh, uh, it would like to engage Paul in this process and say, okay, we're uh, reviewing this, uh, Paul is in charge. Um, Paul has a ORCID, so I copy that as well. And uh, after Paul had uh, created his peer review and uh, informed the uh, peer review service about the outcome, uh, the peer review service can submit the outcome or the result of this peer review. And again, this process is very, very, very simple, right? We all know that peer reviews can be much more complex than uh, what I'm going through here. So now the service says, okay, Paul Vork was the one uh, doing the peer review. He has an ORCID. And Paul is a really critical dude. He really didn't like it. So uh, it's actually rejected. He recommends rejection. And uh, he also has something to say along the lines of, nah, don't like it, right? Um, so, so that's Paul's peer review. Uh, and uh, you would hit submit in order to uh, uh, basically send this uh, sort of a notification back to the uh, a repository. I'm going back to your repository, open uh, the repository homepage in a new tab, just because I want to preserve this message here. And um, if I now click on the landing page of this just uploaded article, I'll see that there is now uh, the notification uh, received and uh, the, uh, the repository can convey that a review of this just uploaded article has been conducted. And uh, it has a uh, a URL to it. I can even click on it, of course, and I'll be redirected to where the peer review lives on the side of the uh, review service. And I get all the information that, um, that was uh, you know, basically inputted into the form field, all the information that the peer review service uh, would like to convey about the conducted peer review. So the point here of this, uh, of this demo is to showcase that a uh, a repository uh, can in, um, implement technology that I'll get to in a second uh, that allows you to request a peer review uh, from a distributed system, from a system that is potentially completely independent of the repository, but could also be as part of the repository, of course. Uh, and request a peer review. Um, the repository, uh, I'm sorry, the peer review service will do its magic, will do what it does, and uh, uh, send a notification back to the repository service once the peer review is conducted. So two independent parties, potentially independent parties, communicating in a standardized manner, exchanging messages in a standardized manner. And then once this uh, uh, process is complete, basically you have the opportunity to link all these bits and pieces together, right? Your repository uh, can link to the conducted peer review. The peer review service can uh, uh, link the peer review to the, uh, to the uh, to the article uh, hosted by the repository. And uh, so that's basically becomes a fully connected graph, right? 
So that's uh, that's how this can work on a very high level uh, um, and, and, and on a very shallow description, basically. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the technology and into what is needed to make this happen on those uh, on both ends, both in this case, meaning the repository and the uh, peer review service. And for that, I'll use some slides. Uh, and uh, as a disclaimer, of course, those slides are uh, based on what um, Herbert Van Example had shared basically a year ago uh, at um, a previous meeting uh, conducted by, by the core group and, and some others. So you may have seen some of this, you may have seen um, the, the overall uh, layout, but I think it, it, it demonstrates nicely uh, what we're trying to convey, what sort of technology is required and um, what, what it takes basically to have these parties in a distributed network communicate and basically speak the same sort of language, right? So the underlying point that we're trying to make here is that the technology, the web technology now really is there. It is stable, it is standardized, it is usable. Uh, we have implementations and libraries and so on and so forth available to make this sort of um, uh, communication on the web possible. And there's basically three main ingredients to uh, this process and this principle. The first one is linked data notifications. The second one is act activity streams too. And the third one is HTTP links. And of course those didn't just, you know, weren't just not launched at, at the same time. Those, you know, the, this result of uh, uh, developments on the web over the last, I don't know, 10 years maybe. Linked data notifications. You can really think of it as, uh, as an email uh, with a structured payload. Right. So you can, uh, so machines would, would know what to expect. Machines would know where to look <laughs> and, uh, um, and the machine can, can fairly easily based on HTTP, which is the protocol as you of course know, underlying the web, uh, send notifications between independent parties. Uh, the beauty of linked data notifications is that the only thing you need to know to send a message to a party is the party's base URL. And that's what I mentioned. Uh, you need to know the base URL the, uh, of the, um, of the review service, for example, to send a notification, a linked data notification to this review service and how exactly that works will, uh, will be very clear in a second. Activity streams too is basically, you can basically think of it as the, the, the common vocabulary, uh, as like the, the payload, if you will, of a linked data notification message. Um, and it's a, a JSON LD serialized. So it's a very friendly sort of a format uh, for machines. And there probably uh, surely is a lot of potential to expand the vocabulary to uh, accommodate for various different use cases for individual parties. But as it currently stands, it seems like a very suitable uh, payload for the sort of messages that we're sending back and forth here. And HTTP links have been around forever. And it really is uh, used to, uh, to support machines and automatically discovering uh, bits and pieces of the scholarly infrastructure, uh, for example, the inboxes uh, of your LinkedIn notifications, bibliographic information of a paper, you know, who authored a paper, uh, what is the persistent identifier of a paper, uh, those sort of um, uh, patterns can be conveyed by use of HTTP links. And really briefly, if you if you have not heard of any of those technologies, uh, don't worry, it's absolutely uh, not a not a not a big deal. Um, uh, and this graph is really just to, to um, visualize what I just said about linked data notifications. You need to know uh, the, the base URL of your target and you just send a, um, a quick, um, very lightweight HTTP request against this target in order to discover the target's inbox. So then you know, where do you send your notification to? Right? So it's a, it can be an, an automatic process. It's designed to be an automatic process for a machine to discover a target's inbox and then send the message exactly there. And the consumer does the same thing from the receiver's end. Uh, you send an HTTP get or head request uh, in order to discover the inbox and uh, receive the message from there. Activity streams too, as I mentioned, a fairly simple um, uh, vocabulary sort of thing. That's a, a, a typical message of what it would look like, JSON LD serialized. And uh, it's, it's basically a way in this particular example, it's a way to convey that some, a person named Martin something, Martin Smith of all uh, people had added a, an article to a blog post and this message conveys you know, what's the uh, ID of the blog post of the article? I'm sorry that he wrote. What's the ID URI of the uh, blog post that he's submitting it to? And some some more information around it, 
you know, some uh, media type information, for example, and those sort of things. Right? Uh, so a fairly flexible, um, accommodating for various different use cases, vocabulary uh, that we can use as a payload for our linked data notification messages. And uh, last but not least, in this uh, lineup of technologies, HTTP links, you might be fairly uh, familiar with those because they have been around for a long time. Um, if not, just imagine a case where you have two uh, resources on the web. Uh, they're identified by URI 1 and URI 2. And let's just assume that URI 1 uh, describes the resource identified by URI 2. So for example, URI 1 is a metadata record of, of a PDF document that is identified by URI 2, right, for example. If you send a fairly simple HTTP request against uh, URI 1, uh, the re HTTP response headers would convey to you uh, that this thing actually describes uh, URI 2. So you have what's called link relation types that basically give links meanings. Right now you can, uh, you can uh, um, summarize basically that URI 1 is a describing resource of uh, 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 URI 2. And that's exactly how the discovery of a linked data notification inbox works. You send an HTTP, a simple HTTP request against the, um, uh, the target base URI, and it conveys my inbox, my linked data notification inbox is there. There meaning, in this case, uh, example.org slash inbox. Right? And it uh, uh, types that link with a relation type as specified here. So that's how a machine would learn where to send a notification to. And I indicated earlier already that um, uh, HTTP links can be used on a very flexible uh, spectrum, basically. Just uh, envision this, we've all seen this before, a uh, landing page in this case of a, of a plus one article. And uh, you and I, you know, as humans, we can easily derive, you know, who authored this work, what's the title, um, what's the DOI in this case of this work by right? the persistent identifier, uh, where are, where's the PDF document, if I'd like to print it maybe, um, where's the uh, bibli other bibliographic information about this paper. Uh, humans can easily do that. If a machine lands on this page, uh, less so, right? A machine is not uh, that, that smart, basically. You need to be able to type these links, and that's exactly uh, how um, uh, HTTP links are used as well with the standard and standardized uh, specified relation types, link relation types. So for example, uh, the page, the landing page could convey uh, a link to, um, to the author's ORCID um, in order to convey that uh, the person identified with this ORCID has authored this paper, in fact. And that link would be typed with the link relation type rel equals author, which is standard and uh, uh, specified. So everybody, everybody that, uh, that um, encounters a link with a rel equals author knows what it means. It's, it's the identifier of the author. Right? The rel equals site as is something fairly new that actually um, uh, Herbert Mann's example had standardized, uh, and that is to convey the persistent identifier of an article. Because we all know that you know, the URI of this plus one landing page is different than it, the, the article's uh, DOI, right? So we want to make sure that we're citing this article by means of its DOI and not by means of, its, of the URI of the landing page. Therefore, we need to convey, uh, uh, if you want to cite this thing, then cite it by means of the DOI. So cite as is to, to convey the PID of an, uh, of, of, an, of an article, if you will, of a scholarly object. Okay, so how does this all uh, uh, fit into, into our scenario? And I'm sure you can already do the math. Uh, basically, we're using LinkedIn notifications to send messages back and forth between these uh, disjoint and potentially independent parties in a distributed network. Excuse me. Uh, we rely on uh, all of these individual parties uh, to be able to receive and send LinkedIn notifications. Uh, as part of that, they need to be able to discover um, the inbox of a party that they'd like to send a message to. And they also need to be able to make their own inbox discoverable to parties that would like to send them messages, right? Our messages, again, are uh, JSON-LD, uh, serialized activity streams, uh, uh, to is the vocabulary, if you will. And again, as I mentioned, there's, there's probably potential to, to expand on that and uh, uh, to be able to accommodate for, for more use cases, more complex use cases than we currently um, have implemented in our brief demo that I just showed. 
and uh, we're, we're, uh, we're promoting HTTP links to make this discoverable, uh, to make the inboxes discoverable, and to potentially also discover uh, uh, discover more, um, let's say, bibliographic information about um, about resources. All right. So several different scenarios, uh, use cases, implementations are of course uh, conceivable. Um, what we have done, um, and I'll go through this now in a very conceptual uh, level, is um, uh, applied the technology to a use case that is very similar to what I just demoed, but a little bit more um, complex, if you will, or actually uh, leaves out the reviewing step and uh, uh, just implements a, an acknowledgement step from the um, overlay service. Maybe let's just uh, uh, jump right in. So imagine a case where you have, again, these two uh, independent parties. You have a repository on the one hand, and you have an uh, uh, overlay, a review service uh, on the other hand. As I did in my demo, a preprint has been uploaded to, re to the repository, and the preprint is identified, uh, let's say, by your IP. Right? As I mentioned, uh, it is required for both parties that are part of this use case to be able to receive and to send LinkedIn notifications. And for that, uh, as a consequence, they need to be able to make their uh, LDN, the LinkedIn data notification inboxes, discoverable for machines. Right? And we do this by means of HTTP links. So now uh, Kathleen comes along as uh, in, in my, my demo and would like to request a peer review for the preprint identified uh, by the URI P. And uh, therefore, uh, a link data notification is being sent from the repository's end to the uh, overlay service, to the inbox of the overlay service. Uh, this link data no notification uh, contains uh, several bits and pieces of information. Um, most importantly, probably, is the URI of the preprint, so uh, URI P in this case. Um, and uh, there might be other uh, URIs included in the payload. For example, if you wanted to further describe the preprint, you could uh, surely do this. And as an activity streams to uh, activity type, we use uh, the type offer as basically an offering, if you will, to, from the repository to the, uh, to the overlay service. And there might be different scenarios where different uh, activity types uh, are, are more appropriate than, than offer in this case. Um, the, now you can say maybe the overlay service wants to know a little bit more about the preprint rather than just uh, the, uh, the it's URI, right? Maybe it needs more metadata about the preprint in order to you know, convey some more information or make a more informed decision of whether to actually review this thing or not. And so some of that could potentially be conveyed in the payload of the actual message, or we can use uh, um, our HTTP links to convey more information about the preprint. So here's where I'd like to step to back to my demo and um, if I find my mouse, it's always an issue when I switch back and forth between these things. Okay, here's a mouse. Excellent. Um, the, oh, here we go. The landing page of my article, right? If you remember, uh, I just copy and paste that URI of the landing page, and I sent a simple HTTP request, uh, a head request against this uh, URI. Is the font large enough? Should I increase it maybe a little bit? Let's see what we can do. If you cannot read this, please let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll go through this. So I sent a simple oh, HTTP so. head request. It's still quite yeah, small, all right. You need to make it quite a bit bigger, I think, Martin. Uh, all right. That's getting better. Is it better? Okay. So now, of course, I lost my mouse again. <laughs> Here we go. Um, I sent a simple HTTP head request against the uh, landing page URI of the article, and uh, my repository conveys additional information about the, the article. For example, uh, it uh, conveys the ORCID of the author uh, with a relation type, a link relation type rel equals author, right? as I mentioned earlier. It also uses the rel equals site as link relation type to convey uh, the scholarly object um, that is identified uh, by a, a PID, a persistent identifier, is to be cited with this. And uh, to uh, just to step back a, a second here, it also, of course, um, 
uses the uh, HTTP links to convey the inbox of the, the link data notification inbox of that repository, right? So that's another uh, essential part of our infrastructure here that we need to do uh, to tell anyone who wants to send a message, send it there. So that's one way of uh, conveying additional information uh, for interested parties in this uh, scenario. Okay, let's move on. Uh, the overlay service now of course, receives the message in its inbox and um, uh, as I, um, I jumped the gun there to, to an extent, right, it may need to some more metadata, uh, uh, may require some more. So it could now, since it has received the URI of the preprint, uh, send an uh, HTTP head request against that URI in order to uh, aggregate more information about the uh, article for which it is asked to uh, conduct a peer review. And then uh, the overlay uh, uh, service now considers, should I do a peer review, should I not? Uh, and uh, um, sends eventually a message back uh, that can have uh, two payloads, uh, either or two different decisions, basically. Either it accepts the request and would actually do the peer review, or it uh, flat, flat out rejects uh, the uh, peer review request. And at that point, uh, the, the interaction would stop basically, right? And this, as you notice, is a step that we have not implemented in our pilot that I showed earlier. We just, excuse me, omitted the step and went straight to the assumption that the overlay would, uh, would do the peer review and would just send back the, uh, the outcome of the peer review. So this is basically an intermittent step uh, where the uh, overlay service has uh, the responsibility to send an uh, acknowledgement, yeah, uh, um, received and I'll do it or it sends a rejection back to the repository saying, no, nah, not doing it um, because you know, no capacity uh, or other issues may prevent the overlay from, from conducting the peer review and accepting uh, the offer. Okay, so and, and of course the, the repository then will uh, receive this message and uh, uh, can potentially uh, already uh, conveys some information on its own end, right? At this point, let's assume the overlay service had responded with an acknowledgement, yes, we will do the peer review, your offer is accepted. Uh, at this point, the repository already knows this is great and I can convey this information on my end by saying uh, my preprint over here that is identified by your IP is currently under review. So that's already you know, uh, a piece of information that the repository just now learned and that it can convey on its, for example, the landing page of the, of the preprint. So that's already added information that we can already incorporate at this particular point. Right? And then the, uh, the overlay will, will do, its, uh, do its magic. And then you know, by definition for the sake of this uh, conceptual view here is a black box of how it exactly conducts the peer review. And uh, whether it's you know, uh, two reviewers, three reviewers, uh, five rounds, two rounds, single blind and so on and so forth. Uh, who cares at this point? Uh, there are several different scenarios that we can accommodate and, and envision. But the point here is that at this point, uh, the overlay service already knows that it will do a peer review and the peer review will be available as a web resource uh, on uh, hosted by the overlay service uh, identified uh, by URIR, let's say for re review, right? At this point, now the overlay service can already convey, hey, I am doing a peer review of your IP and it will eventually be available at URIR. This may be uh, already conveyed or it may just go as far as saying, I am doing a peer review of this and this meaning your IP. So at that point already, uh, the overlay service can convey additional information about the process, what is going on. But of course, these, these bits and pieces are still uh, disconnected uh, because the process is not yet complete. All right, so let's assume the overlay service has done its job. Uh, a review has been created and it has been published uh, at URIR on the, at the overlay service. The overlay service is hosting the peer review. And now it would send a message back to the repository's LinkedIn a notification inbox conveying exactly that. Peer review is completed. Um, I'm responding to your offer. So there needs to be a connection uh, between these two messages. Right? The, the overlay service needs to refer back uh, to the rece originally received message. And it does so by conveying, I am replying to uh, the identifier of the message that you originally sent me with the offer. Um, and here, by the way, uh, most importantly, is the URI of the peer review that I'm hosting. So now 
uh, the, the graph is basically fully connected again, because now the overlay service can say, I reviewed uh, your IP and the outcome is uh, what I'm hosting here at URIR. And the repository can do the, exactly the same thing. My article that I'm hosting, uh, identified by your IP, was peer reviewed. And the peer review is available over there on the other uh, uh, um, uh, node that I have no control over, the overlay service, uh, identify at URIR. All right, so now I can do the bi bidirectional linking uh, between these uh, newly created uh, resources of uh, the, the manuscript on the repository end and their actual review on the overlay end. And that's where to go back to uh, these, uh, the landing page of my, my article on the repository side, that's where, uh, where I can I create my bidirectional link, right? As I just said, now it is reviewed. I can convey this review uh, on the landing page and uh, the mouse. Okay, here we go. The review service can also convey that it has uh, reviewed an article right here, the one that I just um, uh, uh, requested a review, review for and can therefore also convey, I, I've done work on this. This is what I have reviewed. And uh, you know, I can convey additional information of who reviewed it and maybe some, some uh, process information about these sort of things as well. So I hope this was um, uh, somewhat coherent and uh, it gave you an idea of how the technologies can interplay with, uh, with our use case, uh, with uh, potentially your use cases, um, with um, uh, pain points that you saw, uh, you know, leading up to, to this sort of meeting. I hope it clarified a little bit uh, about the, um, the black box of technology behind it. It's really not that, uh, not that difficult. Link data notifications are simple HTTP transactions. Uh, they are, their targets and their inboxes are automatically discovered. Um, HTTP links are trivial to implement. Um, they are really beautiful in a way that uh, they're easy to discover. They make life uh, on the web for machines much simpler. Um, and activity streams too might be a little bit of an uh, um, of a headache uh, right now. Honestly, it was to me as well when I first started looking into this, but it turns out to be a fairly intuitive um, uh, vocabulary that is uh, very flexible and uh, accommodating for, for different use cases. So we found it very, um, uh, a very good fit basically for the sort of messages that we intend to, to send back and forth. Uh, so for that, I think I'll, I'll open the floor or uh, hand over to Paul in case I, I missed something or uh, Paul just wanted to, to add something. Um, and then we can probably move to the discussion part of this, right? Right, thank you, Martin. Um, Martin, I wonder if, if you could just say a few words about the, the, the sort of high level technical components which people would need to implement here. I mean, um, in your diagram that the, the basic diagram about how linked data notifications works has those components in it, I think, you know, the, the receiver and sender and so on. So if we could just spend a moment on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, happy to. Um... Thank you. That's the one you're talking about? Yeah, that one. I think, yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, so it really, on the implementation end, comes down to a number of libraries that we have used uh, that are available for, uh, as, as open source for anyone to use, depending on your preference on uh, programming language, let's say. Uh, and it comes down to a, um, to, to, to a machine that uh, is uh, connected to the, to the internet, of course, and can handle HTTP transaction on a specified uh, port. Um, that's, that's how we implemented it. Uh, and um, we just, you know, pick a non-standard uh, non port that, that uh, you or your uh, IT department can, can open for you um, to, to be able to, to set up this, this, this inbox, which basically is just a piece of software uh, provided by, by a library. Um, on the uh, on the on the HTTP links end, uh, so the the notion of providing an automatic uh, automated discovery mechanism for the inbox is part of the link data notifications uh, specification. So that is something that needs to be done, uh, and that is usually something that a, a web administrator could uh, could do for you. Um, uh, 
depending on, on your, your web server infrastructure, um, implementations may vary there. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a trivial thing to, to implement. Um, and that's, that's basically really it. Uh, uh, in terms of sending and receiving a notification, it's a simple uh, HTTP post uh, message or HTTP post, HTTP post transaction to send a message. And it's a simple HTTP get to, uh, to, to consume the message and then actually uh, um, do, do something intelligently with it. Uh, in our demonstration, for example, we build an entire, you know, uh, um, a graph, triples graph for, for the uh, bits and pieces that were received. Um, that was because, you know, we like these sort of things, but it's not, it's not absolutely not, not necessary. So at the bare minimum, you need, um, uh, you need probably some uh, ports open. You uh, need some software libraries to do the magic, uh, to, to uh, implement the inboxes. And you need to make sure that the inboxes are discoverable uh, by means of HTTP uh, links. The notion of consuming a message and what to do actually with that is basically downstream application. Uh, and also the same thing uh, with uh, sending a message. The, some of these libraries can help you uh, send a message and consume it and then do something with it. But that's basically where the specification ends, where the, spe the linked data notification uh, specification does not tell you what to do with the received message. That's, uh, that's up to, to the individual implementation there. I guess that, in terms of um, yeah. I guess in terms of people trying to position their repository and their service in this picture um, for most of well for all of the use cases we've looked at so far um, each party in those use cases is going to be both a sender and a consumer of linked data notifications so they're going to be represented in both ends of that of that diagram um, the target is the um, in the case of a repository the target is likely to be the something like the landing page for a um, um, a resource in the repository so it's it's a it's a page as um, a resource in web terms and so that leaves the receiver um, and I think that's the the sort of the part which doesn't really exist yet um, for most of our most of the people in this this call. Um, so the receiver is is the the bit which will be um, receiving the linked data notifications. It has to be listening and, and waiting for them, much like an email inbox, um, and that needs to be implemented somewhere. Now, that could be implemented within the repository software um at sort of added on to the repository software or it could be a separate process run alongside the repository and the same arrangement at the other end of the of the use case you know the, the peer review service or overlay service um, and that's one of the things which we will people will need to think about fairly early on in this process if they're going to implement this it's where where does that receiver um, live and who's looking after it for you um, or is it just something that you um, extend into your your repository or your or your service yeah that's a really good point and thanks for for uh, following up on this Paul the you know in, in terms of the design of the um, uh, notification framework um, it is designed to be supporting a distributed infrastructure right? it is all based on identifiers on the web your rights um, but the, uh, it doesn't stop you from from in, uh, from, from uh, basically implementing the target and the the receiver and uh, within within uh, under one domain, if you will. If that is your use case, that's entirely uh, possible and and probably reasonable for a lot of use cases, right? But, um, so it supports an infrastructure where all of these components are completely disjoint, have absolutely nothing to do with each other, uh, politically, geographically technically whatnot uh, but but they can also uh, all be all be under the same umbrella that's entirely possible absolutely what one of the very nice um, benefits of this kind of approach is that you could move the receiver change it completely um, at a later date and as long as your target resources are advertising the inbox in the correct place, then that doesn't matter. So it's actually a nice distributed model that's less um, fragile than um, 
a sort of hard coded point to point type of arrangement between services. Mm -hmm. it, absolutely, and there's also sorry for interrupting you. There for a it's also um, what we've shown in the in the demo, and also in the in these graphs or in the in the uh, structure structural diagrams. It was only a one to one sort of a relationship, right? This could be easily a uh, one to many or many to many sort of a relationship, right? That's the distributed uh, infrastructure. We only show the uh, connection and messages being sent back and forth between repository A and overlay A. Uh, and as I mentioned in the demo, you know, Kathleen knew the base URL of uh, one uh, review service. Um, it, it doesn't stop me from requesting a second, third, fourth review from a different uh, review service. Uh, and so uh, this can can branch out any way, uh, any way you, 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 you'd like, basically. So I'm not restricted to uh, uh, overlay service A only, um, but anyone who's, who's speaking that language, let's say, who, who implements these sort of technologies can be part of this infrastructure. Okay, 